Abba Yehua, I just want to praise you and I just want to thank you this day, Father. I thank you that as we are intently looking at these commands, as we are working through our Exodus chapter 20 and we're looking at each one of these commands, Father, that you are doing such a mighty work as we're looking through these commands and as we're starting to understand these commands and as we've had a look at every command being lined, and being lined up with the plagues and understanding each plague, understanding each command, Abba Yahuwah, I praise you and I thank you, my Father, that you are so faithful in the way that you are opening things up to, to us in this time and in this season, that you are opening up the eyes of our understanding for us to understand the time that we find ourselves in because truly great darkness and today we are looking at the plague of darkness and great darkness is coming upon the earth and we see how it seems to be creeping up on us ever so quickly. I just stand in awe of the things that I see. But I praise you and I thank you, Father, that when it's going to get darker, then that means that your light needs to shine ever brighter because it's going to be in that time of the darkness where your people need to arise and shine and shine your light for all to see your glory. And so the darker it becomes, then it says those who are going to be righteous, those who are set apart righteous, they are the ones that are going to be able to shine like the stars of the heavens, it says in Daniel. Those who are going to bring those to righteousness, those who are going to bring and teach people to be able to come into your righteousness, into your set apartness, into your holiness, they are going to shine like the firmaments of the heavens. Because those who are going to be able, there will be those that will become brighter and brighter and there are those that are going to become darker and darker. And deception is just getting more and more. And that is the thing that I'm realizing. I am realizing how many people are feeling, are falling more and more into deception. And so, Abba Yahuwah, I just want to thank you, Father. Because once our eyes have been opened to the lies that is out there, then we know the truth. And this is what we've got to understand, and this is what we're going to understand tonight, because tonight we are dealing with this third, the, with the ninth command of we shall not lie. We shall not give false witness. And so, Abba Yahuwah, I just want to thank you that you will open up the mind of our understanding, that you will be able to come and open us up to the fuller understanding of what you're wanting to reveal in this hour with this command. I thank you, Father, that you will come and speak to my mind, speak through my lips, the very oracles, my Father, that's going to come from your heartbeat so that we may come to the revelation of the knowledge of the truth of what you wanting to speak to us in this hour. So I praise and I thank you, Father, that I just commit myself to you right now, knowing that you alone are the one that is going to be able to come and speak to your people in Yahushua's name. I pray this. Amen. So yes, we are going to look at tonight, we are looking at the ninth command and the ninth command is we are not to bear false witness. We are not to lie. And that is in Exodus chapter 20 verses 9. So in Exodus 20 verse 9, we are looking at the ninth command. And it says, you do not bear a false witness against your neighbor. So we do not bear false witness against each other. And so at the end of the day, a false witness becomes a problem. Because when we are trapped in deception, if there is lies that is within us, we will be able to go deeper and deeper into this 
command that we are not to give false witness, we are not to lie or to give our false witness to our to our neighbor. And so we are going to look at what is this ninth command, how this ninth command is tied to the ninth plague. And how does it tie in? And so in order for us to be able to understand the fullness of this command, we need to go back to what the father was doing in Egypt when he was dealing with the ten plagues. And so what was he dealing with in this ten plagues? So we are going to look at Exodus chapter 10. And we're reading from verses 21 to 22. And it says, And Yahuwah said to Moshe, Stretch out your hand towards the heavens, and let there be darkness over the land of Mitzrayim, even a darkness which is felt. Hmm. Listen to that. A darkness that is felt. So do you see how the world right now is going into such a darkness that it's being felt? So how is a darkness being felt? And so if we have a look, let's just quickly read verse 22. And Moshe stretched out his hand towards the heavens and there was thick darkness in all the land of Mitzrayim for three days. So this plague came for three days. Now I understand. This seems to be the one time where we know that a plague lasted for a certain number of days. And so this can speak volumes. You know, whenever the Bible talks about three days, it's so significant. Because we know who was it that was in the belly of the earth for three days and three nights. That went into utter darkness. None other than our Messiah. And so whenever the Bible talks about three. We understand on the third day. Yeshua resurrected from the dead. So there's great significance in the three. And so when we look at this thick darkness. That word thick is the word H. 653, which is Afela, Afela. And what does this mean? It means darkness. It means gloominess. It means calamity. Wickedness. Very dark. So we have to understand that this is not just a darkness because it was a darkness that was felt. So we have to understand that when this darkness comes, it's a darkness that comes with a gloominess. It's a darkness that comes with calamity. It's a darkness that comes with wickedness. Now, is this not where you see the earth going Right now. You hear me? Every single time I do a teaching. What am I speaking? I say great darkness is on the horizon. We are in the time of great darkness. And then people would think to to themselves, what is she talking about darkness? Now you understand. It is a time of calamity. It is a time of wickedness. So when I am saying we are in great darkness, it's not just the fact that it's getting dark. It's getting dark because the wickedness is increasing. People are becoming more and more wicked. So the wicked will become more and more wicked, it says in the book of Daniel, and the righteous will become more righteous. So at the end of the day, so even if people, so listen to what I'm going to say to you. 
If you are not sold out, set apart, becoming, coming to a place of where you're being filled with the fear of Yahuwah, if you are a lukewarm, mediocre little Christian, you're not going to make the thick darkness. <laughs> because those that were a little bit good, only, you know, they, they, they just got this salvation. They are going to start becoming more wicked. And this is what I'm seeing happening around me. Where people are allowing their hearts to become darkened. Why are their hearts becoming darkened? Their hearts are becoming darkened because of the wickedness. Because they might have opened themselves up to delusion, which is what we're going to look at today. And that is why I'm saying, we have to guard our hearts in this hour, people. Because out of there comes every issue of life. And who knows the heart? None other than the Father. And the heart is wicked above all things. And yet we can think we stand so righteous before the Father. But he is in the process, and he has been in the process of years. Since 2020, I've been giving all my prophetic words that the Father gave in 2020, where I was writing just about, I, I can't even tell you, just about once a month or once every second month, he was giving me a prophetic word that I was writing. Prophetic words. And Father kept speaking, I am testing my people. 2020 was a year of great testing. Great testing. Double portion 10. 10 is the number of tested and trialed. And it is double portion. So understand, it was a time of testing to see would men's hearts fail them for fear. Many people died because of fear. Many people went to hospital out of fear and died in hospital because they feared. So we have to understand that the Father tests us. To see what is within us. Did he do that to the Israelites in the wilderness? Did he, just, did he just start teaching them his ways? They were being tested. They were being tried in the wilderness. And that is why it is so important for us to understand. That we need to understand Father's way. We need to understand how the Father does things. We need to understand that the Father puts us through severe testing in order to be able to see if he, we are faithful enough to, to do the work that he's got for us to do. Do you think you're just going to arise and just think that you can be the remnant and yet you have not been tested? A remnant bride is one that has gone through. I don't know, how, I don't know what Bible you read because if I read my Bible, I see how many times it says, and, and there's going to be a narrow road, and the narrow road is the narrow road of Philipsis, which is the, the, the road of affliction. And there is suffering. And we are going to have to suffer for his name's sake. So this is when we understand this wickedness, this darkness that was felt. So it wasn't a darkness that was seen. It was a darkness that can actually be felt in the spirit. Now, I've been in many places that I can sense the darkness to such a degree. I have gone to places when, we've, when I've had to go do prophetic work in certain places that when the Father sends me to a place, it is so dark that I feel the darkness and the evil of that place to such a degree that I actually literally vomited out of my mouth. That that place has got such wickedness, such evil that has been done in this place that I have to vomit it out because it is so wicked. That's the level of darkness that I will experience in my spirit man. And so when we have a look, there's going to come a time of great darkness before great destruction. So the Father is going to bring a darkness before there's going to be the greatest destruction. 
So there will be a time of darkness that's going to come upon the earth. Remember, this is the second last plague before the great destruction that's going to be, before a real death of people. So I want you to understand before there's going to be a great death of people. Father warns us with the darkness that comes. The darkness is there as a warning for us to understand. There is a warning for us to repent. There is a warning for us to be able to turn to him. There is a warning. And so this ninth plague of this Great darkness, this darkness that could be felt upon the earth. So it says it's a time of great darkness that comes before great destruction. Abba removes his light. When Abba will remove his light, he removes it before the destruction comes. Now, please, I do not want you to think that this is, this is now going to be our little rapture story. Cause we better get our theology right. We've got to understand that the darkness becomes so intense that there is more wickedness than there is his, his goodness. And that is why in the end it's really going to be a remnant because there will be so much darkness upon the earth because brother is going to turn against brother in these last days and there's going to, wickedness will increase. And so what was this ninth plague that ties into the ninth command? What was this ninth plague? And why was the Father bringing three days of darkness before there's going to be a death that's going to happen in the land? He's already preparing them that there's going to be great mourning that's going to come from this darkness. After this darkness, there's going to be a mourning that's going to come. Now listen. Here we see the father is now going to come against, Abba Yahuwah is going to come up against Pharaoh himself. Why? Because Pharaoh was seen as Ra. Now who is Ra? Ra was the sun god. And Pharaoh was this God for all the people. All the people of Egypt perceived him to be the God of Ra, which was the greatest God, because he was the God of the sun. And Pharaoh was seen as the light that shined throughout the whole of Egypt. Now, you know, like I said to you, I, you know, when you read this, you can't really picture it. You know, because you read it, but you, it's, it's, it's not something that you picture. But I'm telling you now, when you've been in these temples, oh my goodness, you can picture it. Because you will see the Pharaoh. You will understand why Pharaoh was a god, because if you go to that big temple there in Luxor, one of the biggest temples that's there, the Luxor temple, when you walk in, there is the, I'm this minute little person standing there in a statue that stands, I can't tell you how high of the Pharaoh sitting on his throne, on his chair. And there's two of them on either side. And this magnificence of this temple. And then you see the Pharaoh. And you sit there and you think, wow. And I didn't even go to the Valley of the Kings. I can imagine if I were to have gone to the temple, the temples there of the Valley of the Kings. But that was just, you know, Father had us being able to deal with the gods, not with the kings and the pharaohs and everything else. We needed to deal with the gods because this is what Abba was coming up against, was the gods. And these gods are the gods that are still speaking today in many of our lives that we have not been delivered from because many of us are still bound in Egypt by these gods of Egypt. And so this ninth plague was 
seriously coming up against the sun god. And why? Because he was the one that was shining throughout all of Egypt. And every, everything was about him being this god of Ra. And you really see it in this Luxor temple, like I said to you, because it's the Pharaoh's um, statue is huge. And so, but Abba was going to strip Pharaoh from his light and show all of Egypt that their God and their Pharaoh cannot make light. Cannot make light when there's darkness. So even though he is seen as the God of the light of the sun, as a Ra, because he would be the one that would be the most shining in the whole of Egypt. Father was going to show them, nothing that you're going to do is going to bring light. And you're not only going to experience light in terms of darkness, but you are going to experience such a thick darkness that it will be actually felt, because that's what it says, that the darkness was felt. And so this is what the Father is going to come up against. And so in Exodus chapter 10 from verses 27, so I just want to read that uh, verse 21 again, that I just want to be able to read this. is in Yahuwah said to Moshe, stretch out your hand towards the heavens and let there be darkness over the land of Mitzrayim, even a darkness which is felt. So you see, for those that are truly spiritual, whom the Father really has given an insight into being able to experience things because they've got some prophetic gifting, they feel the darkness. They can walk into places and feel the darkness. A darkness can be felt. And that's the kind of darkness that they had. Now, in Exodus chapter 10 from verses 27 says however you would strengthen the heart of the Pharaoh and he would not let them go and the Pharaoh said to him get away from me watch yourself and see my face no more for in the day you see my face you die wow so who's going to die in the end the arrogance but I want you to understand that He hardens his heart. And this is what we're going to need to understand because at the end of the day, when there's lies that come in, we've got to be very careful of lies because lies can come and harden our hearts. And this arrogance and pride in the lie that we believe becomes a delusion in us. And we've got to be very, very careful of this. And so he turns around and he says, you will not see my face lest you die. So by this time, the Pharaoh is now at the place. Look at the great darkness that has now come upon the Pharaoh's heart. So what is the difference between the strengthening, the the hardening of his heart that was right in the beginning of the first plague to the hardening of the heart of the ninth plague. Because on the ninth plague, now he's saying to Moses, don't even come and stand before me again, lest you die. So, people will turn around and they will say, but it's not fair, because it's the father who hardened the Pharaoh's heart. But we are going to understand today That when you believe a lie, the Father gives you over to a spirit of delusion because you believe lies. So at the end of the day, does the Father, is it the fact that the Father strengthened the heart? So the Father hands you over to a spirit of delusion, but why does he hand you over to a spirit of delusion? He hands you over to a spirit of delusion because of what? Because of your doing. 
So is it really the father hardening the Pharaoh's heart or does the father already know the kind of heart that Pharaoh has? The father knows the Pharaoh's heart is filled with arrogance and pride and the father knows that Pharaoh thinks he's Ra. And the father has seen what he has done. The father has seen how he's made himself to be the God of Egypt and how he is the one that is having to be seen by all to be this mighty man and he's raised himself up above the creator of the heavens and the earth that he has raised himself above that and so at the end of the day we are going to understand that if we do not humble ourselves before the father how many opportunities has he had to humble himself and if you do not humble yourself before the father he will hand you over to that very thing that is within you. And so the very thing that he stands and says, do not stand before me because I will kill you. Yet he doesn't understand that in three days time, the next plague is going to come. And there will be death. But it's not going to be death of Moses. But it's going to be death in his own camp. Death in his own palace. That he can't even understand. And so we've got to understand that with lies comes death. There's a death that comes when there is a lie. And so we've got to understand that the darkness starts to operate in our hearts that will then eventually bring us to spiritual death. And this is why it is so important for us to understand what we need to understand now because we start to darken our soul man to deception because of the lies that is within us and understand that is exactly what the enemy wants if the enemy can get you to believe a lie he's already deceived you and if he will deceive you he can get you to be able to then be like the Israelite like the Canaan um like um Adam and Eve that were thrown out of the garden because of the deception. But it came through the lie. So if we go look at Revelation chapter 16 from verse 10. In Revelation chapter 16 verse 10, it says, And the fifth messenger poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his reign became darkened. And they gnawed their tongue from pain. And they blasphemed Yahuwah of the heavens, Alua of the heavens, for their pains and their sores and did not repent of their works. This is the ninth plague. Has Pharaoh repented? He gets a little bit soft and says, okay, take your people. And then he changes his mind again. And so at the end of the day, they will not repent. Why? Why will they not repent? We're going to see. If the Father allows them repentance. Why? Because they have come under the deception. And if they do not make a conscious decision to want to, they get opportunity and opportunity given to them for repentance to be able to get to the place of repentance so they can get confronted with things to get them to a place of having to repent. But they make a decision to say, I do not want to repent because as far as the Pharaoh was concerned, he hadn't done anything wrong. You are the one doing wrong. What do I need to let you go for? I don't need to let you go because I'm Ra. I am the sun god of this whole land. As a matter of fact, not only of this land, because by this time they were the greatest nation in the world. They had become this great nation after um, Joseph when they had had the, the famine. People were coming from all the nations of the world, and by this time they were in debt to Egypt. And so when we look at Revelation, so yeah, we see that there is a great darkness that's going to come. That's going to be upon the people. But yet they still will not repent. 
And so then we look at Revelation chapter 9. And in Revelation chapter 9, we're going to look at verse 1 and it says, And the fifth messenger sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven, which had fallen to the earth, and the key to the pit of the deep was given to him. And he opened the pit of the deep, and the smoke went up out of the pit, like the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun was darkened, also the air, because of the smoke of the pit. So there will be a darkness that is going to be there. And out of the smoke, locusts came upon the earth, and authority was given to them as the scorpions of the earth possessed authority. And it was said that to them that they shall not harm the grass of the earth or any matter or any tree, but only those men whom they had that do not have the seal of Alua on their foreheads. And it was given to them that they should not kill them, but to torture them for five months. And their torture was like the torture of a scorpion when it stings a man. And now look and see, in those days men shall seek death and shall not find it. And they shall long to die, but death shall flee from them. So there's going to be, the pit is going to be opened and there's going to be a darkness. And it seems like this darkness is going to last five months. Five months. So, before great death and great destruction comes a darkness. Where the earth has to, it's almost like where the earth has to come to a standstill before what is about to be birthed upon the earth. So when this great darkness is going to be, now could this be that it's when the stars are going to fall from the sky and the sun is not going to give its light and the moon is not going to give its light that we've read about in Joel, that we've read about in Matthew chapter 24. And these things are going to come. And so we if understand if the if there's the, the 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 sun doesn't give its light, if the moon doesn't give its light, if the stars don't give its light, then there's going to be a darkness that we don't understand because even at night we don't have that utter darkness. Look at the darkness that there is when there is a cloudy night, when it's a, a storm coming, and when it's totally and utterly dark. When there, I mean. I know because with us staying on the farm, you can go outside when there is no no moon and stars in the sky. It is so dark that sometimes you can't even see something in front of you. It is so dark. It's such a dense darkness. Because when there's still stars, you can still sort of see. But if you go outside when there is, when there's, it's, it's over. Over, uh, when it's cloudy and it's overcast and you can't see the, su- the moon and the stars, it's such a darkness that you cannot see what's just ahead of you. You can't see it. That's a, like a dense darkness. And so I can imagine what it must have been like for them. And so... Like I said, Father will bring a darkness. It seems like there's a darkness just before there's going to be great death that's going to come. I just want to, I didn't make a note of it, but I just keep having this go look at Matthew chapter 24. So let's just look and see here. Matthew chapter 24 talks about the great tribulation. And then it says, and immediately after the distress of those days, the sun shall be darkened. The moon shall not give its light, and the stars shall fall from the heavens, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, and then the sign of the son of Adam shall appear in the heavens. Now, you know, it always it always have, um, amazed me how it's going to be that all eyes are going to see him when he comes. I, 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 it's always like, it's like, wow, Father, how is it going to be that all eyes... 
all eyes are going to see him. How, how is that possible? All eyes are going to see him. But think about it. If the whole earth is going to be in that utter darkness, when there's going to be no sun, no moon, no stars, and the world will be in utter darkness, imagine when Yahushua comes in his majesty and he is the light, and all of a sudden, it's like when the sun rises, and you know, as it's rising, it's getting lighter and lighter before it rises, but as it eventually comes out, you will see, then all of a sudden light is all around you. And this thick darkness of the night sky is gone. And now you have this light that, is a, that, that now lights up everything for you to see. Imagine this is going to be all over Yeshua's coming. That all eyes will see him. Why? Because we've been in thick darkness. For five months or for however long it's going to be that all these things are going to happen where the sun and the moon and the stars are going to fall from the heavens and then all of a sudden we are going to see him coming. And when he comes, he comes with all his light. And so, wow, it's so powerful. So when we have a look at Luke chapter 23, if we look in Luke chapter 23, Just based on what we were saying now. In Luke chapter 23, and you look at verse 44, from verses 44 and 45. And it says, And it was now about the sixth hour, And darkness came over all the land until the ninth hour. So isn't it interesting that when Yoshua, when Yoshua gave up his last breath, at about the sixth hour, and darkness came over all the land until the ninth hour, and the sun was darkened, and the veil of the dwelling place was torn in two, And crying out with a loud voice, Yoshua said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. And the captain, seeing what took place, praised Alua, saying, Truly, this man was righteous. And so here we see how at this very moment, as Yoshua is going to give his last breath, here at three o'clock the afternoon, He gives up his life and all of a sudden everything is in darkness and understand at the Passover this is when there would be full moon in the sky but I mean there's now a sun in the sky and there was this thick darkness that came over the over the whole place that was darkened. So Was that like an eclipse that for three hours that the sun is there but the sun is darkened and the sun is not giving its light. And this is interesting. This is getting interesting because, you know, I haven't made much out of this eclipse that's coming. Everybody's talking about the 8th of April. There is an eclipse coming. And it's very interesting because this eclipse is coming exactly at the time of when we are coming into the new year. Abba Yahuwah's new year. Because I think the new year, it will either be the new moon. So there's going to be darkness. Because there will not even be a moon because the eighth, if I'm not mistaken, should still be a dark moon because I think the new moon is either the ninth or the tenth. So we are in the time of a darkness in terms of the moon because it will not be, there will be no moon. There shouldn't be because I don't think, because I think the Jews are celebrating their new year. Well, not their new year. It's, they basically will celebrate 
um, their Rosh Hashanah is only in, but this is the this this is when they say it's the um, um, the biblical New Year, but they don't really celebrate it. It's not a day that gets celebrated for them, but they will say it's Rosh Hashanah. I'm not Rosh Hashanah. That will be the new month, Rosh Kadesh, because they do Rosh Kadesh at the dark moon, not at the slither of the moon. And at this time, there's going to be an eclipse that's taking place. And, you know, this thing started coming to me and all these people. And, you know, I don't go into these things because it is so many people that all of a sudden want to calculate this and want to calculate that and want to calculate this. And they're calculating all these things and they bring out all these things. And then nothing happens of what they said. With all these things that's supposed to happen, with all these eclipses and all these blood moons and all these things. But one thing that it, we do have to understand is that the signs are in the heavens for us to understand. He puts signs in the heavens for the seasons. Now it's interesting because there will be a sign in the heaven just when we're coming into a new year. A new year, Abba Yahuwah's new year, there's going to be a total eclipse of the sun. Which if I'm not mistaken is over America. It's not always, the eclipse doesn't always happen everywhere. Which generally is going to speak of some kind of judgment. It's, you know, the sun is going to become darkened. When the Bible talks about the moon becoming red and the sun becoming darkened, it talks about judgment is going to come. So which means Father is starting to warn the earth to say judgment is coming. It's at hand. You better start taking note. You better start turning more to repentance. I've told you. I told you all. The prophetic work that I had to go do at the top of, of Mount Sinai was so that the Father would be able to release his fear upon the earth and praise Abba Yahuwah that this, on Tuesday, I found my journal that I was not able to find. That was the prophetic word that I released at Sukkot. So that was the last feast was Sukkot and now we are going to come into a new feast of Passover. And so, it's been six months. And he said, my fear is going to start being unleashed upon the earth was the prophetic word that he had given me. And that was one of the things that he had said in the prophetic word that he had given is that he said that there was going to be the fear of Yahuwah was going to start coming. That was at the end of that was at the beginning of Sukkot, at the end of Sukkot, and he had said that he was going to test the fruit of the people. By the end of Sukkot, we already saw what happened where we went into war, where Israel went into war, and they are still at war. So for the last six months since Sukkot, since the end of Sukkot, they have been at war. But the father was very clear in this prophetic word that he turned around and he said, "My fear." Yeah, but now I am going to bring my fear. People will now begin to know the fear of Yahuwah. People don't fear me because for so long, all they do is get told that it's love, 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 and no one fears me. S to turn from their wicked ways, I have said, choose you this day whom you will serve. You will either serve man and this beast system, or you will serve me. I will not have mixed seed. This is part of the prophetic word that he gave. So, I don't know what's coming upon the earth. I have no idea. I have not taken much notice of this because why? Every time it's cry wolf, I get like all these things that keep coming up on my phone. It's this eclipse. It's going to be this. It's going to be all these places like in Nineveh. Every place has got to do with Nineveh. Every place in America where this is going to hit is like a place of Nineveh. It's got Nineveh in it or something to that effect. That this was the first thing that I saw. And I thought, okay. What's coming, Father? I don't know. But it's, it's not by accident 
that we happen to be doing these commands now and it happens to be this time now and we happen to be talking about a darkness. We happen to be talking about the fact that this darkness is even when Yeshua died that there was a no sun in the sky and there's a total eclipse coming. It's not like they come often. It's not like every year there's an eclipse. But my curiosity was picked up yesterday, last night, when yesterday somebody sh- sent me a um, a message from this woman that has worked with elephants, I think for the last, I don't know, 30, 40 years she's been working in Africa with these elephants. And these elephants are behaving very strange. And they're all going to higher ground and they're going to higher ground and they're all just behaving very strange. And I'm thinking, Father, what is this? I know that when the tsunami hit in Phuket and even when it hit in Indonesia and a lot of those places, the animals ran to the highest places. So the animals feel the vibration of the earth that we cannot feel. There's something. It's almost like, is it the fact that the father takes them to protection? I have no idea. Because the father will have to take care of his creation, isn't it? He takes care of his creation. I mean, I get amazed how there will be this huge storm that happens and there's this violent wind that's blowing and people's um, rooftops get blown off, but you will have a little, a little, um, uh, uh, a, a, a nest in the tree. And the nest will not fly out and neither do those eggs fall out either. So who keeps the nest on the tree and who keeps the little eggs inside the nest in this violent storm? can only be my father because he's the creator and he will take care of his creation if he says you will go and harm man but you don't harm the creation you don't harm no tree no nothing of that gets gets harmed then he's the one who's going to do it so I'm just in a place that I'm saying, I don't know what the Father is about to do. I don't know what the Father is going to do. I just know that we are, we are, we've got to understand thick darkness is coming upon the earth. We are in the time of thick darkness. And so just like Yoshua, there was, it was like an eclipse. All of a sudden the sun went darkened didn't give its light and there was darkness for three hours upon the earth just as Joshua was giving his last breath now if we look at John chapter 8 verse 12 in John chapter 8 verse 12 it says therefore Joshua spoke to them again saying I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall by no means walk in darkness, but possesses the light of life. So what do we need to do? If we are not following Messiah Yahushua, you see the 144,000, let's just have a look at this over here because this is just coming up to me. Man, for a moment I've read this and I've read the scripture how many times and I'm reading it with new eyes all of a sudden that I've never seen before. Because it says, especially when I am now understanding a lot more things, because I think the Father is really opening up the mind of our understanding to be able to really start understanding Scripture in a much deeper revelation way. Now listen to what he says. I am the light of the world. He who follows me. Not he who, know, who who just hears about me, not he who just reads about me, but he who follows me. Please take note of that. Because he didn't say, he who knows all about me. He who reads all about me. He who does a little bit of what I say. 
To follow a person means you walk in their footsteps. That's what it means to follow your rabbi. You learn from your rabbi, believe me, it's very scary when you see these young children, you know, when in Israel, when they follow their rabbi, it's quite scary. Because if the rabbi smokes, I have seen children as, no, as young as 9 and 10 in the streets in Israel smoking because they follow their rabbi. I've been at a Shabbat table where the rabbi is busy giving a message and the rabbi is busy taking his little tot of his vodka or whatever it is and he's passing it around and every one of his learners, every one of his followers eventually leave there totally drunk because it's a tot after the other and a tot after the other and these rab and these youngsters are doing exactly what their rabbi does. They follow the rabbi. Now, do we follow our rabbi? To follow the rabbi means that if you want to be my disciple and you want to follow me, so it means you need to become a disciple. To be a follower of Yeshua means to be a disciple. So you're not just a hearer of the word. You are one that's going to do the word. Man, the Father is opening this up to us tonight here. Because at the end of the day, he says, if you follow me, only if you follow me, you shall by no means walk in darkness. So do you understand what he's saying to you there? If you're going to follow him the way that he lived, the way that he walked, no servant is greater than his master. If you're going to follow him, then you are not going to have any darkness that's going to come upon you. The darkness that's going to come upon the earth is not going to be able to come upon you because you are going to be a follower. Now, hear me clearly when I say to you what the Father is opening up to us of here now. What is he saying? If you want to follow me, if you want to be my disciple, you need to follow me. Then you need to do what? You need to deny yourself. Which means my little flesh man is not going to be on the throne. Which means I don't have any rights. Which means I'm going to lose my rights. Which means I'm going to deny myself. Which means it's not about I. Like a, 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 a something that was sent to me today. The, the, wor- the, the, the essence of pride is I. Because I is on a throne. And pride comes before a fall. Because it all becomes about I, 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 I and what I want. I does not feature if you are a follower so that you do not come into the darkness. If you are not going to follow Messiah, listen to me. It doesn't help you to just say, I am a Christian. Because I go to church. Because I read my Bible. It's not about you being a Christian. Just because you go to church and because you read your Bible. For you to be a follower, it means that you are going to be, listen carefully. If you want to follow me, you need to deny yourself. What did we listen on Shabbat about the fact that we need to be able to break down every one of those flesh, flesh attitudes. These are the works of the flesh. This is the fruit of the Spirit and this is the works of the flesh. This Shabbat we will be dealing with the fruit of the Spirit. But we've dealt two weeks with, the, with us having to look at the flesh. Because the flesh is all about me, myself and I. I being on a throne. And you see, the spirit is at enmity against the flesh. Why? Because it's two spirits operating. You're either in the flesh, which means you've got the devil operating within you. Why? Why? Let me tell you why. Because when the curse came in the Garden of Eden, what did the father say to to the serpent? On your belly you shall crawl and you shall eat the dust of the earth. (coughs) Excuse me. So the serpent was told to eat the dust of the earth and he was going to crawl on his belly. So by crawling on his belly he was eating the dust of the earth. What are we created out of? 
We are created out of the dust of the earth. We are created out of the dust. So our flesh man is the dust. Our body and our soul, mind, will, emotions is the, that's the flesh man. That is what was created out of the dust of the earth because we are spirit. Because he breathed spirit into us. So he, when he breathed into us, we became spirit. So we are a spirit being that carries a, that carries a, bo- we are in a body, but we are a spirit. But we live in a tent called a body. And we have a mind, a will, and an emotions. That happens to be the intellect of man, which is the nefesh, which is the soul of man, which is the flesh of man. And where the mind goes, the man follows. Where the will goes, the man follows. Where the emotion goes, the man follows. Because this is the tent. So if the tent doesn't get hooked in with the spirit, it will follow the mind, the will, and the emotions, the soul man. So why is there enmity going on within us? Because we were created out of the dust of the earth, and while we were created out of the dust of the earth, Father breathed his spirit in us, so that we are now a spirit being. And we are those that says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind through the word. So the word transforms your mind, and we start to put into practice what we read and what we hear. Shama and Shamar. Hear Shama. Shamar. See. Obey. So to Shamar is to see and to obey, and to Shama is to hear and to obey. So we read it, we hear it, and we obey it. But now, if you are a flesh being, and you are in your soul, where your mind and your will and your emotions is not submitted and surrendered to the Father, then what is it that happens to you? You are a person that is going to be led by your flesh, which means you are led, you are being fed by the devil who is eating on your flesh because he eats the soil. He's eating the dust of the earth. So guess what? The devil is feeding on this flesh man of ours. He feeds on our mind, our will and our emotions where he becomes strengthened in us. Where we will become demonically inclined. Where we will become fleshly beings. Because we are not being led by the spirit of Yahuwah. Are you understanding here? So, you have this war going on within you. Which is exactly what Shaul spoke. Paul spoke. The, the thing that I want to do, I do not do. And that which I do not, and that which I want to do, I don't do. And the thing that I don't want to do, I do. There is a war going on within me. Of course there is. Because you are a spirit being given by the Father, and your spirit is either going to be able to submit to Abba Yahuwah and His way, or your soul is going to submit to the devil and His way. Because the devil is eating on your soul. So your soul is either going to be lined up with the spirit of Yahuwah, which means that then you will be, your mind, your will and your emotions will be submitted to the spirit of Yahuwah, or your mind, your will and your emotions will be submitted to your flesh man, which means that you will do what the devil wants you to do. So we are at war. And that's why people will turn around and they're fighting the devil. The only devil that you've got to fight is the devil that is operating through you, through your mind, through your will, through your emotions, to be able to get you to submit to him. But you have the authority to master over it, which is what it says, what Abba Yahuwah spoke to um, Cain when he said in uh, 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 Genesis chapter 4 verse 7, Sin is knocking at your door, and you have the authority to master over it, over him. Who's the him? Him is the devil. Sin is knocking at your door. But you have the authority to master over him. And who's the him? The him is the devil. I couldn't understand why my Bible says that sin is a him. Why does sin become a him all of a sudden? Because who's the him? The him is the one who's feeding on your flesh. 
The him is the one who's feeding from the dust of the earth, crawling on its belly, feeding on the dust of the earth. Why did he hate? Why did he hate uh, Esau? Jacob I love, but Esau I hate, because he sold his birthright for a plate of soup that was to be able to feed his flesh, because his body wanted its way. And so our body wants its way many times. Our body's I, I, I. I want this and I want that. And that's why I say, we repent enough to be forgiven. But we don't surrender enough to be changed. And that is the the criteria of what we've got to understand. We repent enough because we want forgiveness from the Father. But do we change enough to, do do we surrender enough to be changed? Because it's in the surrendering that we truly changed. Because the eye is still on the throne. Now listen to what he says. Here. Genesis chapter 4 verse 7. Is it not if you do good, you are to be accepted? And if you do not do good, towards your door is a sin. He is lying. And towards you is his desire. And you must, mo- I mean, you must rule over him. So all of a sudden the sin becomes a, an, a him. And he is lying. And towards you is his desire. You see, the devil wants his desire in you. And you must rule over him. You must rule over this devil that wants his desire over your flesh, man. Because now you're going into a little emotional thing because what was Cain of you and this very little story, he became jealous of his brother because his brother's uh, uh, offering was accepted and his was not. And the father said, if you do good, would you not also be accepted? So why do we have to be jealous? Because if you're doing what the person does, then you too will be blessed. But he says sin is lying. The devil is going to lie in your ear. And what is he doing? And his desire is for you. And towards you is his desire. And you must rule over him. So there we go. So what is the Father saying to us tonight? For you to be able to follow Yeshua, you need to deny yourself. You need to pick up your stake. You better pick up your cross. And you better follow him. You need to deny yourself. You need to pick up your cross. You need to pick up your stake. And you need to follow him. So, Whatever he did, you do. So then what makes me think, I'm not going to go through any trials or any tests, and I'm not going to go through any persecution, and I'm not going to be stabbed in the back, and I'm not going to be betrayed, and I'm not going to go through all these things, and then I want to still defend myself. Did he defend himself? And then I'm sitting there in the Garden of Gethsemane. I'm going to go to an oil press. I'm going to have to go to my Gethsemane. I'm going to have to be put in an oil press. And what is that going to mean? Oh my goodness, those olives, that olive tree is going to be shaken so that the olives fall to the ground. And then for those that haven't been shaken, it's going to be beaten. So when the rest of the olives that have been shaken, so you're going to go through a shaking by the Father. And when you don't want to be able to fall to the ground with your shaking, because he's going to shake you until you fall to the ground. And you don't want to fall to the ground, don't worry, you'll receive a beating. Until eventually those olives fall to the ground. And then they're going to be put in a process where they're going to be washed. And washed and washed. So he's going to try to cleanse us and cleanse us and wash us with the word and wash us some more. And then we're going to be chopped up. And chopped up and chopped up. And then we're going to be salted. (laughs) And then we're going to be put in a barrel. And we're going to lie there for a while until all of that then falls to the ground and then the oil comes up. And then you can become a first fruits offering for him. Remember, we all want to become a first fruits offering for him, but we don't want to do anything. So listen to what he says when he's telling us here in John. Because really he's opened up a major revelation for me here tonight. I, I, you know, I have read the scripture. I don't know how many times, but I have never seen the scripture like he's opening it up to us tonight. 
Isn't this amazing, the new revelation that is coming our way? I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall by no means. So you see, they were in Goshen. Those that were in Goshen, that were being protected by the Father, there was no three days of darkness in Goshen. There was no three days of darkness in Goshen. Because those that were in Goshen were not being part of the plague. By no means walk in darkness. They don't walk in darkness. Why? Because they follow the Lamb. So I ask you, do you follow the Lamb? Do you do what He does? Because if you follow the Lamb, then you have to do what He keeps. You have to keep what He keeps. You have to do what He does. You can't turn around and say, oh, that's all nailed to the cross. I don't need to be able to keep the Shabbat because you know what? That We don't need to keep it, but it's part of the Ten Commandments. Yeshua kept the Sabbath. I don't need to keep any of these feasts, but you're sure was at every feast. Oh, I don't need to eat anything that is, that is, um, you know, I can eat whatever I want. I don't need to keep to Leviticus chapter 11, food you should eat, food you shouldn't eat. No. Did you sure eat anything that was defiled? No, he did not. You follow him. He went to a garden of Gethsemane. He said, Father, can you please take this cup away from me? Yet not my will, but your will be done. Will I be in a situation when I too am going to have to pray, Father, please take this cup away from me, but it's not my will, but your will be done. So you're going to put me through this process, and this process is going to be difficult, and I'm going to be dying at 10,000 deaths in my flesh. But Father, I will go through not my will, but your will be done, because I will not make my own plan. I will not go my own way, but I will surrender to you, and I will allow you to have your way in me, even if it means it's going to cost me in my flesh. I'm going to be persecuted. No servant is greater than his master. If they hated me, they will hate you. If they denied me, they will deny you. Whatever they did to me, they will do to you. You will be, you will be persecuted. You will be spoken of behind your back. You are going to have people betray you. You are going to have your best friends but stab you in the back and betray you because they did it to him. Nobody is going to be void of that. So that we can be in the light. Because he says, but possess the light of life. So they are those who possess life. And what's the life? Narrow is the path that leads to life and few find it. What is the life? Outer court. I am the way is the outer court. Yeshua speaking, I am the way, the outer court. I am the truth, the holy place. I am the life, the holy of holies, which is where the presence of the Father dwells in the holy of holies. Narrow is the road that leads to life, holy of holies, and few find it. Why? Because they're not willing to be able to follow him. Wow, Father, you've got your own sermon here today, my word. Thank you, my Father. By no means walk in darkness, but possess the light of life. They have the light that gives them life, and they will have no darkness, because they follow life himself, Yeshua, to the presence of the Father in the Holy of Holies. There's no shortcut into the Holy of Holies. You have to go through the process of going to surrender your life on a brazen altar. Out in the outer court is the brazen altar where you lie your life down. You lay it down on a brazen altar. No longer I that live. Then you have to come into the holy place where you've got a menorah, seven spirits of your where you've got the table of showbread. You're going to be being taught by the word. You've got the spirit of your having to Teach you his word. You got the you got the 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 altar of incense that's going to be lit by the coal that comes from the brazen altar. So you've got to become a blazing fire coal for the Father to be able to offer him sweet smelling aroma incense. That then he takes you into the holy of holies, which is where life is. So let's tie this up with a scripture that we were going to finish off now. As he's put his sermon together here, we'll continue next week. 
What does he say? And they sang a renewed song. We are going Revelation chapter 14 from verse 3. Let's just read verse, verse 14. So who are those that are going to be spared from the, that are not going to be able to go through the death that's going to come? When the darkness comes upon the earth in Revelation chapter 9, there's going to be those that will be able to go through this. And who are those that are not going to be harmed? Look and see what it says in Revelation 9 verses 4. And it was said of them that they shall not harm the grass of the earth, any green matter or any tree, but only those who do not have the seal of a lure upon their foreheads. If you don't have a seal, you will be harmed. Now look and see. Now we get to Revelation chapter 14. And I looked and I saw a lamb. And standing on Mount Zion and with him 144,000 having his father's name written upon their foreheads. The seal. And I heard a voice out of heaven like the voice of many waters and like the voice of a loud thunder. And I heard the sound of, of harpers playing their harps. Revelation chapter 14 from verse 3. And they sang a renewed song. Before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders and no one was able to learn the song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. And they, they are those who were not defiled with women for they are maidens. They are those following the lamb. If you want to follow me, you will not be in the darkness. The darkness is going to come upon the earth in Revelation chapter 9. That darkness as well. Oh my word, the Father's got a sermon here. And those following the Lamb wherever He leads them on. They were redeemed from among men because first fruits to Allah and to the Lamb. And listen carefully because this is the crux of the matter to the what we're dealing with in this command and how the Father, I'm going to have to go listen to this teaching because this is not even in my notes. The Father is giving us his own sermon. Because what are we dealing with? The nine command, you shall not bear false witness. You shall not lie. Listen. And in their mouth was found no falsehood, no lies. For they, follow, for they are blameless before the throne of Allah. And so we end off with verse 5 that says, And in their mouth was found no falsehood, no lie. For they are blameless before the throne of Allah. What are we dealing with? We're dealing with the ninth command which says you shall not bear false witness. You shall not lie. Now we would say, oh, you don't lie about another person. What lies do you, Father, the ones, no lies. No liar is going to inherit the kingdom. What lies do we take upon our lips? This is a very deep message. This is very, very deep what the Father is giving us here tonight. We have heard a very, very powerful sermon out of the mouth of Abba Yahuwah. And Abba Yahuwah, I stand humbled before you right now, Father. Because you alone have preached a sermon yet tonight that only you could have brought. Father, we can read scripture over and over and over again, but you are the only one that can tie the scripture together to what you are saying in the hour that we need to hear it. Because we are in a critical hour. It is not by accident that there is going to be a total eclipse of the sun happening at a time of when we are about to go into a new year. And you are bringing a warning to say it's time to truly repent. And that thing, repent, is not just repent because I'm repent for me to be forgiven, but it's one that's going to surrender in order to change. And so I thank you for this, Father. I am humbled before you, my Father, for what you have done here tonight. 
I thank you for your sermon that you have preached here tonight, Father. Where you are really starting to open up scriptures to us that is beyond our understanding. I praise and I thank you for this in your name. I pray this. Amen.